Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Annika, and um, th thank you for that introduction. It's always nice to see which bios from life pop up, but it's really great to be with everybody today. I apologize, I couldn't be at the um, earlier sessions. Um, in uh, I'm I'm based in Boston, so um, that I think that was maybe a little bit early in the middle of the night for me. But it's it's great to be with everyone now, and um, I think. Uh, following, I'll share my screen as well, but I think where the, it's, it's a really good connection because where uh, the previous presentation left off and some of those questions around media and digital infrastructures, uh, that will be what I will share with everybody today uh, to kind of frame the conversation continued around what are the media implications around uh, some of the civic fracturing that we see and some of the, um, the resulting issues uh, around um, around harm and, and issues of discrimination against communities. Uh, I will say that my, my comments in this research will be contextualized in the United States because that's where the locus of my research has been for the last few years. Uh, but uh, they do apply as, as was mentioned in my bio, I've worked um, in global capacities around these issues for many years, uh, particular focus in the Middle East. Uh, so hopefully there will be some connection across these barriers. So I will try um, I will try my best to use my 10 minutes um, because of time constraints to provide some uh, to provide some comments that can be helpful. And let me just share my screen, uh, folks. And um, if this works, okay. Um, <clears throat> so the title of my talk is "Persistent Media Literacies: Civic Empowerment and Cultural Participant in a Time of Rampant Media Cynicism." And this emerges from some research that we've been doing recently looking at uh, looking at the contours of people's information, daily information realities and their daily information ecosystems and how that, um, how that pertains to their uh, locus of participation in the issue. Oh, that's not my, that's not one of my children, I, I don't think, and I'm happy because normally it is my children, but it's this morning there, I think they're, they're doing something else. Um, so I, I just start with a kind of comment that I think I, I think that the scholar Michael Bugeja um, writes about, which I think is a good frame for this. In an age of ubiquitous media and robust online networks, we struggle with the rigors of the human condition. And I, and I want to kind of focus that on, on these two areas that we've been writing about recently. So I've kind of combining things here. Uh, it was mentioned this idea of distributed propaganda and the hijacking of local news. And I want to just add some I'm going to talk through these phenomena with with folks quickly. Uh, that this notion of spectacle and the and the main the maintenance of the spectacle within these social networks, uh, combined with um, internet subcultures' ability to distribute propaganda uh, and information without the need of uh, the, without the need of uh, mainstream media organizations, they serve as amplifiers. But that in these internet subcultures. Um, just that, that particular groups can distribute and spread uh, information with, with little regard for its civic value or its civil credibility in platforms that prioritize spectacle and the extraction of human data. So it creates a, a little bit of a, a challenge. And I think that's what our, uh, I think the previous speaker was, I think, alluding to in some of these issues we have. And the second part of this is, at least in the United States, is the social networks and large scale media companies um, gutting local news infrastructures, which are really important for what we're talking about, civic, co civic cohesion and the acceptance of, of diverse groups and communities and the result in trust. So I'll, I will um, take you through these two spaces uh, uh, today in my talk and end on this intervention, another model as the speaker mentioned around persistent media literacy. So uh, I guess my first, the first notion around spectacle just quickly, I don't think any of these tools are, um, I don't think the, this is not a very complicated slide, but I don't think that these are foreign anybody. I do think it's really important in our conversations of um, of of distributed propaganda to to articulate, as I think Kara was talking about, the algorithms, which we call, which which normally have this um, understanding as like an algorithm is something that's non-human or it's like an ambivalent machine when it's absolutely not. It's, it's, it's designed in, with intentionality to extract certain information or certain ideas or certain um, scopes of being. So 
all of these tools that, that I put above here, they are designed with intention. And the intention is not, um, the intention is never to uh, provide different information to groups or to provide uh, robust, diverse um, opinions. There are spaces where that happens, so not to be totally critical. But for the most part, uh, research has been showing us for the last 10 years that these technologies actually, um, they're actually really good at distributing propaganda and reifying polarization within groups. They're very homophilous. They work um, to bring like-minded groups together and they work very hard to uh, support trust with like-minded groups, right? And the closer peers are to you in terms of information sharing, the more we trust those groups and the further it pushes us from the institutions that we relied on. So this idea of, of the spectacle and distributed propaganda happens here. So you can even just see in, in recent work on uh, vaccine discourse. So in the United States, this is something, I'm, I'm sure globally, but in the United States, this is something that we're tracking now in terms of online internet subcultures and their approaches to vaccine. And we see, I think fairly, um, you know, fairly rampant reifications, the same thing as we saw in the United States around issues of, um, of police brutality, of the killing of unarmed black men in the United States and of our, um, our, our soon to be former presidents need to kind of continue to amplify some of this disinformation that in, in internet subcultures, it works, it works very well. So, um, you know, you see it, there's as much as this graph shows, there's as much examples of the, the, this disinformation to be spread and sustained uh, through these social infrastructures. And I think the, um, for me, the important point here is um, that I wanna share with folks is that much of what we've considered around trusted networks, as, as I talk about the next topic, um, at least in the United States, if you think about our legacy media, and again, this could have some tran translation to, to global infrastructures as well. Uh, many of them have opted into prioritizing the sharing and spread of information into these social networks continuously. So this chart just shows you on the left, the organizations and on the top bar, how, uh, how much they're plugged into uh, social networks and social infrastructures. And it's, it's very ubiquitous. And the problem when news and organizations opt into these spaces, um, they're opt into spaces that do not have, that, that, are, that are almost unaligned with the values or the so-called values of news organizations, which is to provide credible civic information to, um, to communities, right? So that societies can function and societies can be exposed to information. And so what, when they opt into these tools like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, they actually opt into tools that values are nothing to do with civic cohesion um, or very little to do with civic cohesion. And, and again, then we come into questions of regulation. So the result of this obviously is spectacle and distributed propaganda is that in these communities where these tools are so present and creating these homophilous groups, they actually work to just sustain spectacle and sustain information realities that work against what we need in civil society. Um, I think what we need to bring civic cohesion back, right? So, um, and I, I just actually put this in as a resource at the last question. I, <laughs> I, I created this slide while you were, while I was hearing those last questions. Um, there's a lot of really good work on algorithms now. Um, and I, I personally think this is at the intersection of, it's at the intersection of regulation it's not oftentimes in the media literacy spaces where I research, we ask how citizens can be better consumers of media, which I think is, is I actually think it distorts the real problem, which is like far reaching invasive corporations that design algorithms to uh, extract things. And then we ask citizens to be better information consumers in environments where uh, they are completely unaware of the way in which information is created and, and provided to them. And oftentimes these companies come back on the idea of algorithms as ambivalent machines, which is completely not true. They are in, they're designed by humans with very, um, with, you know, very exacting intentionality. And we, oftentimes we, we, we fail to interrogate that and we ask how can we do better to create citizen environments? It's really hard to go into these technologies and say, we're gonna create a robust environment when the design is the opposite, right? The, all, the only design is to keep people engaged most of the time. So that leads me to my second point and then my conclusion. So we know that the result of, of, uh, of like these 
these technologies of distrust and distrust in our public institutions is down um, across the board. And, and the, the, I think the main reason which, which there's consensus around distrust is that when people are further removed from the public institutions that serve them, uh, they are, you know, it's very harder to kind of build a, a, an innate trust. In the United States, this is true. The MIT uh, about a year or two ago published a study looking at Twitter and they found in every instance, the most common the metrics that using emotional sens sensationalized information and, and peer forms of reinforcement um, creates, uh, creates a, a farther spread of misinformation, right? And it's, and, it's, and it's rooted in distrust. The other phenomenon that's led to local distrust in the United States at least is um, the gutting of local media infrastructures, right? Which we know research shows are, are, are more important than most other things in, in um, providing a base for civic infrastructure. So when, when folks are, not, are, are forced to go into these social spaces or digital networks and not rely on the local infrastructure uh, for information, it often abstracts what's needed to kind of understand the, the folks in their immediate vicinities. Um, and then one last comment on, on where distrust leads. And I think one of, your, one of the participants asked about these social media channels. What's been a really fascinating phenomenon in the United States context around what's happening now. And I um, apologize if this is US centric, but it's kind of on my mind now, but I think it's relevant. Um, in the wake of our election, there was a big backlash against social media tools as being too regulated. And I think this is really interesting. And so when we were, ta we were talking about Telegram, which is a really interesting encrypted space in the United States, uh, many of the groups that we, we want to reach with social media when they thought that the mainstream networks like Facebook and Twitter were, were overreaching in their regulation of information, uh, they jumped to networks like Parler or Gab or MeWe that are that are premised on being um, unfiltered uh, spaces where there will be no regulation. And so it was, it's really hard to think about how we combat, um, how we combat these infrastructures, right? So I just wanna close, I know in my last minute on um, rethinking, so on, on our model as Julian said, like if we approach rampant media cynicism, I, I don't have time to show this, but I will, um, I, can, I can talk through this. There's, um, there's a, a, a doctoral student that mapped every instance of protest on the planet um, based on uh, G-DELT data. Um, and uh, every time an instance of protest was covered in media. And if you see from 1997 to 2013, at the, every instance of uh, tech, uh, invasive mobile technologies, protests on the planet increased. Um, and and I think we have this situation where, where we've been working on it. I'll just, I'll end it at this point and, and not, not to kind of um, go too far over time, but um, where we've been entering into this as interventions is uh, the, the, where we've seen um, our approach and, and it's, it's really to start at the, at the local community level. And we look at how you can actually build interventions with, um, with civic society groups or with community stakeholders around how they can start to combat this. And oftentimes it's more about what messaging can we share without the, the idea of like how these messaging actually approaches issues of care in society, issues of imagination and persistent engagement against what matters. So we've been, we've been working with models and apologize for the brevity of this in 10 minutes. Um, that takes a series of value sets that we've identified um, that matter in community spaces, caring and people's critical consciousness, their ability to imagine better futures, their ability to feel that things are connected over time and persistent, and their ability to feel that they are part of solving a problem. That at somewhere between people's voice and their cultural participation is that level of agency. And we've been focusing a lot on how you can build media interventions at the point of agency with individuals. Um, through some of these value mechanisms. I'm happy to share more about them um, at a later date, but I think I'll stop here because of time and um, welcome any feedback or thoughts or comments to this presentation. So I will stop sharing and, and thank you all for, for listening.